Welcome. My name is Annie Rogers, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining today's ADHD Experts presentation titled, What is Your Child's Sensory Profile? Strategies for Supporting Children with ADHD and Sensory Processing Disorder. Sensory Processing Disorder, or SPD, is a condition that affects how the brain responds to information from the senses, all eight of them. Children with SPD may be sensitive to and overwhelmed by certain sounds, smells, textures, foods, environments, and the like. They may also be under-responsive to these inputs. No matter how SPD manifests, parents need a strong understanding of their child's unique sensory needs, as well as the tools to support those needs. In this webinar, you will learn how to determine your child's sensory pro profile and leave with practical strategies to support your child's sensory systems and facilitate self-regulation over time. Leading today's presentation is Candace Peterson. Candace is an occupational therapist who has served children and families for the past nine years, working in schools, clinics, and homes. She holds a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's in occupational therapy. Candace has also been trained in sensory processing, feeding and eating, motor development, executive functioning, and visual processing. She has a passion for addressing sensory processing needs through sensory integration therapy, which she believes helps children learn to su participate successfully in daily activities. Before I hand over the microphone to Candace, I have just a few housekeeping items. Those of you tuned into the live webinar may download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you are interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you will receive around an hour after the live broadcast. If you are listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 394 to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. Finally, the sponsor of today's webinar is Brain Balance. Brain Balance is a holistic cognitive development program designed to help kids, teens, and adults with ADHD, processing disorders, anxiety, and beyond improve focus, attention, and behavior. Brain Balance creates a customized plan based on your child's needs to support their social, emotional, and academic growth. An exploratory study with Harvard's McLean Hospital found the Brain Balance program to be as effective as low-dose stimulant medication in alleviating ADHD symptoms in children. Visit brainbalance.com to learn about Brain Balance today. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. So without any further ado, I am so pleased to welcome Candace Peterson. Candace, thank you so much for joining us today and leading this important discussion on sensory processing. Thank you so much for having me and for that introduction. I'm very excited uh, to be here because this topic is so important and um, important to me personally. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, as we go, but let's just quickly go over what we're going to cover in today's presentation. So the first thing we're going to talk about is a neurodiversity affirming mindset, and that's going to kind of be the umbrella for everything else that we talk about today. So we'll talk about that first. Then we're going to talk about what sensory processing means and how to identify your child's specific sensory needs and profile. 
Um, we're going to talk about your sensory profile as a parent, a caregiver, a teacher, whoever you may be attending this presentation today um, that work with children who have sensory needs. Uh, tools and tips to support your child's sensory needs and also strategies to help you regulate so that you can co-regulate with your child, which fosters self-regulation over time. So we're going to talk about all of those things today. So let's get into it. Um, just a reminder, I don't know your individual child, so I can't provide individual suggestions. Um, none of the tools, strategies I provide today are going to be individualized. However, my hope is that you will have a clearer understanding um, on whether to seek further OT services for your child following this presentation, and you also will have a more uh, clear understanding of your child's sensory needs with this information today. Okay, so first of all, neurodiversity affirming. What does it mean to be neurodiversity affirming? Judy Singer, who is a sociologist who has autism, um, she coined the term neurodiversity in the late 1990s. You also may hear it called neurodiverse. And what this means is there is a virtually infinite neurocognitive variability within the human population. It points to the fact that every human has a very unique nervous system with a unique com uh, combination of abilities and needs, okay? So every single person, their brain and nervous system are unique. So we have to determine um, the difference here between neurodivergent and neurodiverse. They are not the same. Okay, so neurodivergent means differing in mental or neurological function from what is considered typical or normal. This is more frequently used to describe um, autistic people, um, but ADHD also falls under neurodivergent as does SPD. And we'll get a little bit more into SPD is not yet in the DSM, but it does fall under this neurodivergent um, term. Also, I wanted to let you know that when I refer to autistic adults, this is how the autistic population typically refers to um, be talked about with identity first language. So if you ever hear me using identity first language, I've listened to the um, to autistic people and that's how they would like to be talked about. So in case you are wondering about that. So a neurodiversity affirming mindset is an understanding that neurodivergence is not something that needs to be fixed. Rather, individual neurotypes are characterized by unique strengths, needs, and challenges. So this movement, this really is a human rights movement, and we are trying to take go away from the idea that this is just um, outside of typical and disordered, but rather that the environment should support individual needs. And with increased awareness and acceptance, we can better do that. So as a therapist, what does it be, mean to me to be a neurodiversity affirming therapist? And that means that I am trauma informed. I am respectful to my clients. I'm empathetic, accepting. I believe in consent and I am always keeping in mind safety and a child feeling safe when they are with me. Um, and this is from the Therapist Neurodiversity Collective. Um, they are kind of leading the human rights movement in therapy. And so um, their website is one of the resources that I have shared with you today if you would like to visit that after the presentation. Okay, so with that in mind, we're kind of using this neurodiversity affirming mindset as the umbrella for which we are going to talk about sensory processing. So let's get into the sensory processing information. What is sensory processing? It's the neurology of how we feel. The sensory messages that we receive from within our body and from the environment, we take that information in, we organize, interpret, process it, and then we use it to interact with our world, okay? So this slide really shows that in a nice cyclical pattern. We receive information through our senses, we organize this information, and then we use it to interact with our environment. And we're going to come back to this slide um, after we talk about the eight senses and after we talk a little bit more about sensory processing disorder so that we can reference it again. Okay, so you probably know about five senses. Maybe you do know about all eight, but we now talk about eight senses instead of five. And these eight senses can actually be further divided into more than 20 senses. Um, so, but we like to condense them into these eight when we're talking about them. So the five that you likely know a lot about are sight, 
touch, hearing, taste, and smell. And you'll see underneath uh, the more technical terminology for each of those five senses. So you likely have um, heard about these and know a bit about these five senses. And we'll continue to talk about them more as we go through some examples today. But I want to talk to you uh, more about the three lesser known senses. So those are movement or vestibular, body awareness or proprioception, and our internal awareness or interoception. So vestibular, this is located in our inner ear, our vestibular system, and this is what allows us to sense movement. When you're going on a roller coaster, it's your vestibular system that is giving you input about what you're feeling. Also, our vestibular system helps us remain upright in conjunction with our proprioceptive system, our tactile system, our visual system. They all work together, but it helps us feel upright. So sometimes when we have children falling out of chairs, we say, hmm, maybe there's some uh, vestibular need here. Body awareness or proprioception, this is the ability to know where our muscles and joints are in relation to one another without having to look. So for example, when you're walking, you don't have to look at your feet, you just walk. When you're stirring a bowl while you're cooking something, you can look at a recipe and stir the bowl at the same time. Our sense of proprioception is one of the, the senses that allows us to do that. Okay, and then interoception or our, our internal sense, this includes things like heart rate, uh, respiration, hunger and thirst, the need to use the bathroom, and it also includes emotions. So we know now how closely connected um, our emotions are to our sensory system. They're part of our sensory system. So this is a more newly talked about, discovered, researched sense. Uh, but now that we have this information, it's really informing a lot of our practice as sensory therapists because it's so incredibly important. Um, if we think about all the daily functions that include these internal senses, um, it really is important. So I'm going to show you a graphic on the next slide, uh, which informs why we think sensory processing is so important. This uh, is a little bit outdated. It's from 96. And so it doesn't have interoception on there. But the more new, uh, the newer models, they're not as easy to understand. So that's why I still use this one. But let's just imagine that interoception was down there as well. Um, so look at how foundational sensory, the sensory systems are for all other development, learning, and functioning. So we see at the bottom of this pyramid, those seven senses add on interoception, and all of these other skills are built on top of sensory processing. So um, OT specifically, we work on the sensory systems. We also work in sensory motor and perceptual motor and some in cognition. So we're addressing a lot of these underlying needs with a bottom up approach. So what that means is we're going to address the most basic need first in the sensory systems, and then we're going to build on top of that. But where do we see these needs manifest a lot of the time? It's in that cognitive realm where we're doing daily, daily tasks, where we see behavior, and where we have academic learning. But if all the way down in the sensory systems, something is off, the rest of those skills are not going to build on top and daily functioning is going to become a lot more difficult. And that's why this is so important. So if we go back to this slide, we basically, basically can say, if there's a hiccup in this process, are we not accurately receiving sensory information? Are we not organizing and processing that sensory information? Or are we not able to use it to interact with our environment? And this is constantly going on all day long. If there's a hiccup somewhere in there, it can become really difficult um, to go throughout our day, okay? So let's get into that, um, These the diagnosis of sensory processing disorder and having increased sensory needs. Um, so sensory processing disorder, it's not in the DSM yet, but we very much know that it exists and it co-occurs with many diagnoses like ADHD, autism, other diagnoses as well. And so what does this look like? Um, in the introduction, she did a really good job of explaining sensory over and under responsivity. And if you've heard anything about sensory processing or sensory processing disorder, you've often heard about sensory modulation. This is the most commonly talked about 
part of sensory processing disorder. So being sensitive or over-responsive to input, being under-responsive, so not sensing it as much as you need to. And then there's another part of this called sensory craving. And that is when a child seeks sensory input. So they're moving, spinning, crashing, falling all day long, but they never seem to get enough. They never seem to be more regulated. Those are all part of sensory modulation disorder. But there are two other categories under sensory processing disorder, and those are sensory-based motor disorder and sensory discrimination. So sensory-based motor disorder includes dyspraxia, which is motor planning um, and motor execution of movements. So how are we able to come up with a plan to move in our brain and then execute that plan? And then postural disorder. So how are we able to maintain our posture, staying upright, using the vestibular, proprioceptive, tactile, visual senses in our everyday life? And then lastly, that sensory discrimination disorder is how accurately is the information that I'm taking in in my environment and within my body, how accurately am I evaluating that? Do I, am I hearing accurately what's actually going on in the environment or am I misinterpreting that? So sensory discrimination disorder means difficulties with accurately sensing the sensory information coming into your body. Okay, so those are all the different um, parts of sensory processing disorder. You can have any or all of those categories. So you may have modulation and discrimination. You may have sensory-based motor and discrimination. You can have any combination of sensory processing disorder. So just with that cyclical pattern, you can see if there's a hiccup in um, how we take in the information, how accurately, how we're processing that information, and then how we're responding to it. So how we're moving through um, space and interacting with the world around us, okay? All right. So we all have sensory needs, including you as um, a parent, a caregiver. Maybe you're, you're an individual um, with sensory needs. I personally do believe that when I was a child, if we understood more about sensory um, information, sensory processing disorder, that I would likely have been diagnosed with sensory based motor disorder. Um, I still, as an adult, bump into a lot of things, trip and fall. I've fallen down the stairs multiple times. And I do believe it's sensory based. I like the way it feels when I run into a doorway. And that sounds so odd, but you know what it does? It gives me feedback so I know where I'm at in space. So I have bruises all over my body all the time. And I almost don't even notice when it happens. Where'd you get that bruise from? I don't know. Um, and I also am a parent of a child who has some sensory needs. So this is a very personal um, discussion for me. I really understand it. And you, even if you don't have increased sensory needs, you still have sensory needs. And depending on stress, depending on the day, your sensory needs can be increased or decreased. So discovering your own sensory profile and learning how to meet your own sensory needs helps you be regulated, and in turn, it helps your child regulate. This is what we know. 80% of co-regulation comes from modeling regulation from a parent or caregiver. 20% comes from teaching strategies. So seeing you be regulated or use strategies to regulate yourself is way more a part of it all, of self-regulation than teaching. So that would be using those cognitive strategies from a top-down teaching those strategies versus seeing it happening. So that's why your own regulation is so important um, when we're talking about teaching our children how to regulate, okay? So let's talk, let's do a little sensory check-in and then I'm gonna talk to you about how I personally do some things to help me regulate um, and maintain my own regulation for my children. Okay, sensory check-in um, for you. So let's talk about some of your sensory tendencies or needs. Um, as you're going through this list, does anything resonate with you? Do you notice that you're sensitive to sounds or easily distracted by sounds, sensitive to lights or busy environments? You'll see in parentheses, I have a little uh, letter there. So that indicates what sensory system um, it correlates with. So auditory for sensitive to sounds, sensitive to lights is visual, busy environments, auditory, visual, that could also be tactile, proprioceptive, vestibular. Are you sensitive to clothing textures? This is a really big one for me. I feel so, so, so much more comfortable 
in soft clothing. I do not like wearing jeans or um, really structured pants. They feel very uncomfortable on my body. Are you sensitive to movement? Um, that's your vestibular sense. So you don't really like uh, going down slides or spinning or using roller coasters, things like that. Are you sensitive to touch from others? You don't like hugs. Um, you don't like when someone brushes against your body, that really dysregulates you. Are you a picky eater? You don't like um, a whole lot of variety of food or maybe you don't like your food touching on the plate. That's the one that I hear a lot. Um, are you clumsy or bump into things? Hi, my, my every single day. Uh, lack balance, also something that I experience. Do you need deep pressure? Do you really like deep pressure hugs, someone laying on top of you, weighted blankets? Do those things tend to regulate you? Do you need movement? Do you feel way better when you run or get out for a walk or um, maybe playing with your children on the playground? Maybe those things tend to regulate, regulate you. I find that, that uh, movement tends to regulate me as well. Do you need oral input? This can often be regulating um, for adults. Things like gum, chewing gum or um, sucking on candy or drinking a smoothie out of a straw. I like to have a cup with a straw near me most of the day and that really helps me regulate um, for that oral and proprioceptive input. So starting to check in with your sensory needs is so incredibly important so that you can get the sensory input or set up your environment to help regulate your body throughout the day. So let's look at um, some ways that you could do that. How can you set up your daily life and routine to support your sensory needs? Let's look at the visual system. Could you declutter? Do you feel very overwhelmed by clutter in your environment? That is a big one for me. If my entire house is very cluttered or messy, I find it very difficult for me to function and I'm more easily triggered. What about colors? Are there certain colors that feel calming to you? Maybe paint colors in a room can make a huge difference. Do you use visualization? Does that help you? We know that visualization is kind of the highest step in our visual skills, and sometimes that can be really helpful. Auditory. Do you like input? Do you like music in the background or the TV in the background? Or do you function much better when it's quiet? I, I tend to like some background noise that actually helps me regulate. Tactile. Can you choose clothes that feel good on your body? Um, especially if you're just at home, having clothes that feel good on your body can have a huge part in your regulation. Can you incorporate movement into your daily routine to satisfy your proprioceptive and vestibular uh, systems? It seems like um, this can be really overwhelming. We often look at it as exercise, but something like a five minute walk may make a huge difference in regulating your sensory systems. Olfactory, that's your sense of smell. So can you utilize calming or pleasant smells or limit smells that bother you? I am very, I have a very strong olfactory system. So calming and pleasant smells instantly lift my mood and make me feel more regulated. Whereas smells that bother me are very dysregulating. So this is a big one for me. Gustatory, have easy to access snacks that regulate you. So that's taste. Um, crunchy or chewy snacks can be regulating for people because they provide a lot of proprioceptive input and then having them also taste good. Interoceptive system, are you monitoring your hunger and thirst? How is your heart rate and your breathing patterns? And of course, our emotions, which leads to a whole bigger discussion, but um, even trying to regulate your breathing and your heart rate can be incredibly impactful. Okay. All right. So we've talked about your sensory system and how important co-regulation is. And um, we're going to continue to think about that as we start to talk about your child. And I wanna talk about how I might work to build what we would call a sensory profile for a child. What questions might I ask um, to help me give more, give myself more information on this child and help their family and also the child understand their own sensory profile? It's so important that at whatever cognitive level is, uh, is appropriate for the child, that they understand their own bodies. So whether that's through play, whether that's through movement, or whether there is some teaching involved there, that's always something that I'm incorporating into my interventions. 
So how can we cue into this sensory profile? First thing we have to talk about is strengths. Let's go back to that neurodiversity affirming mindset, that umbrella that we're operating under. Strengths are vital. We have to cue into these. We have to always be talking about these. Um, oftentimes we go right to the deficits and ignore the fact that our child and their unique neurotype, they carry strengths and we have to acknowledge you help them utilize those on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. How can we honor these strengths? That's always a question that I'm asking. Then I'm asking, okay, what tends to dysregulate them? I've got to think through all eight senses and think about what dysregulates them. Then I have to think about the opposite, what tends to regulate them. And so I go into this very detailed discussion and observation of this child and say, okay, what, what seems to um, maybe have them have a more difficult day? What helps them have a better day? And then moment to moment, what are they utilizing to help regulate themselves? What are adults or other, um, what are parents or other caregivers utilizing to help regulate them? Okay, so this is how I'm building their sensory profile. I'm asking very specific questions that fall under these categories. And then how can I change um, the environment and routines to support their sensory needs? So then we're getting kind of into that plan of how are we going to change the environment? How are we going to change their routines to help support their sensory needs? Okay. So we're going to go into a couple examples of children and um, how this might, you know, what their sensory profile is and then what it might look like to help them with their sensory needs. This is not a real client. I made up uh, these clients today. So the first example we're going to call AJ. AJ is six years old and his strengths are that he is incredibly kind to others. He also, he loves to engage in imaginative play and he also enjoys fine motor activities. So some of his strengths and his interests and we need to utilize those. I'm gonna keep reminding you of that. So what tends to dysregulate him? He tends to cover his ears in response to loud and unexpected noises. He doesn't like people bumping into him. That really bothers him. Certain clothing textures really bother his skin. And he gets more and more dysregulated when he has to go for long periods of time without gross motor play or movement. So those are the things that tend to dysregulate him. What tends to regulate him? He really seems to do better when he can move. When he has movement um, incorporated in his day, he does a lot better. An hour on the playground changes his entire day. When he wears sweatpants and soft t-shirts, he appears much more comfortable. And crunchy snacks, oh, sorry. Crunchy snacks and smoothies are his favorites. Okay, so how can you change the environment and routines to support their sensory needs? Let's take a look at AJ here. He loves a visual schedule, a picture schedule that tells him what's coming next and reference it, reference it, it throughout the day. He especially benefits from incorporating a long stretch of movement 30 to 60 minutes halfway through the morning and halfway through the afternoon. Every snack and meal he eats includes something crunchy. AJ's family has committed to a sensory lifestyle. So a lot of my clients um, and their families, they say, we're going to lean into this and think about sensory needs as a lifestyle, not a home program, not something we're going to do a few times a day. We're going to help our lifestyle conform to what our child's sensory needs are. So let's take a deeper look at this for AJ. So you'll see there it says AJ's strengths and interests are always emphasized and then his needs are supported. So what, what have we done to help AJ out? First of all, let's talk about school. Um, he's doing okay academically, but he does need a 504 plan for school that accommodates his sensory needs. So this allows him to get sensory breaks, get that movement that he um, desires, take a break from the auditory environment that might be overwhelming in school. So he has that 504 plan. Um, his strengths, remember, and interests are imaginative play and fine motor activities. So purposeful time spent with his um, parents really helps increase his regulation because he cares so deeply about imaginative and fine motor play. His parents also use imaginative play as a way to talk through his sensory needs and emotion. Um, emotions. It's a really nice way to work some of, through some of these needs is to use imaginative play. And I use that with some of my clients. 
AJ uses noise reduction headphones for loud noises like the vacuum cleaner and when he is out in public. Um, noise reduction headphones can be very helpful and they also make, um, I know the loop earplugs uh, specifically are very helpful for a lot of my clients now. He also wears soft clothing most of the time. So what about his movement opportunities? They include things like bike riding, going on the playground, and indoor activities like tunnels, animal walks throughout the house, and movement videos on YouTube. So deciding what sort of movement activities work will be individual for your family, your environment, your household, what you have access to. Um, that's going to be very, very individualized, but you'll start to notice if you incorporate more movement if that really helps your child. AJ's family has built these types of activities and environmental modifications to, to their lifestyle, so it is not a home program. It's very natural for them. AJ knows where his noise reduction headphones are, so he can go grab them. There always are, um, there's always movement activities ready to go for him, um, and they've made it part of their everyday life. Okay? All right, so let's talk about one more example. We're going to talk about um, a child that's a little bit older. So this is JL, she's 12 years old, and her strengths and interests are that she loves science-based activities and she loves animals, and she cares very much for the environment and she really enjoys time outside. So what tends to dysregulate her? She really struggles with unexpected change and unknown sensory environment. So she's going into a new environment and she doesn't know what's what it's going to be like. This can be very overwhelming for her. She has verbalized that busy visual areas with lots of things in them and pictures and stuff on the walls are too much for her. So because she's a little bit older, she's able to verbalize some of those needs a little bit more. She describes feeling really tired after group social events like family gatherings or school activities. So those are really, really hard for her. So I want to um, let you know that I've decided to make this client somebody who shifts from being in a school to being homeschooled. I decided to make this shift for this client because some families do decide to do that. So what tends to regulate her? She really likes time in small, quiet spaces and to sit inside a deep pressure pod. I will show you a picture of the deep pressure pod that some of my clients are responding really well to. She does better when her day has a plan. She knows what's coming and the plan doesn't change. That's when she does the best. She also likes very specific music and that she listens to that often. And she enjoys having a few friends who have similar interests to hers, not a lot of different friends that are unpredictable. So she really likes that predictability. She doesn't like a lot of change and a lot of unknown. So how can we change the environment and her routines to support her sensory needs? She en enjoys talking about the next day before she goes to sleep. That helps her prepare for what's coming. She and her family have built quiet alone time into her daily routine, and she had accommodations at school, allowing her to take breaks from the classroom in order for her body to reset. She also really enjoys walking on a nearby nature trail. It allows her to reset as well, and it's very regulating for her. So JL's family decided that the school environment wasn't working for her, even with the accommodations. There weren't enough accommodations, so they decided to homeschool her. So we're going to shift and look at what that looks like now. So what have we done? We've decided to homeschool her to best support her needs. We're always emphasizing and utilizing her strengths and, and interests throughout her daily life. Those are so important. So she has a reset space. This is something I recommend to a lot of my families who have a child who is very sensitive um, to sensory input. So she has a reset space that is very visually simple. Um, oftentimes it can be a tent or a corner of a room or a separate room if you have that available. It's quiet and it contains sensory tools. It's her own space and no one else can use this space. It's safe for her. The tools that she's using in there are deep pressure pod, music player, and her animal books. Those are all very regulating for her. So JL and her family have decided to limit her group outings. Um, this is a decision that they made because it helps her feel comfortable in her day-to-day -day life. And prior to gatherings that they do go to, they talk about options for her to get a break from the sensory stimulation. I'll often talk to my families and they'll say, it's so hard when we go to a holiday event 
or a family gathering, they just absolutely cannot cope with that situation. And one of my very first suggestions is you have to give them breaks. Um, it may be very frequent breaks, it may be just a few breaks, but they have to have that opportunity to reset their body um, and not have to take in so much sensory information. There's so much sensory information at gatherings and in busy environments, so that's so important. And then when talking about the next day, her mom will write down the schedule for her. So they'll go over everything that's going to happen and write that all down. This really helps her visualize and then she can ask any questions she may have and talk through her needs with her mom. It's another strategy that really helps. And then of course, she really enjoys going outside even in um, colder weather. The only time she doesn't really like it is when it rains because it um, makes her clothes wet and she doesn't like that feeling. But most days she spends time outside, which provides her with the sensory input that she needs. And with homeschooling, she's allowed, um, she's able to get a lot more um, sensory input throughout the day and it's become a lot more regulating for her. So that was probably the best decision for this client. Okay, so we talked about some of those sensory tools. So we are going to look, take a look at some of those. As I said, I can't provide um, individualized recommendations for your child, but um, I wanted to go over some of the sensory equipment so that maybe you could take a look at it and see if it's something that you think would benefit your child. So I talked about the sensory pod. So that's this first one here. This is something a lot of my clients are liking. Um, you sit, you blow it up and you sit inside and um, you get some deep pressure. And so some of my clients like spending time in there to help reset their body and get that deep pressure. Um, weighted blankets, of course, are something that a lot of my clients use. Uh, something to remember about any weighted item is that after a while, your body adjusts to um, the weight. So it becomes a little bit less effective than um, when it first is put on. So about 30 minutes, your body kind of adjusts to that weight and then it doesn't have as much effectiveness. A therapy ball is something many of my clients have used. Um, children may enjoy bouncing on it. A lot of children I will put on their belly and rock them back and forth to get some nice vestibular input on it. Uh, body socks also provide some nice proprioceptive input because you can push against, it's usually made out of lycra, so you can push against uh, that material and get some resistance and proprioceptive input. Fidgets, of course, are nice, especially if you're in an environment where you maybe can't get a lot of movement or big sensory input. There's something to give the hands to do and give some input. Lycra swings, swings in general, of course, are great, but lycra swings are often really beneficial because a child can get that deep pressure, tactile proprioceptive input while also getting the vestibular input of swinging. Um, I've had a lot of my clients actually install swings in their home, in their basement, um, and things like that so that their child can get more vestibular input. Um, chewy. Uh, type tools, so something on a necklace that a child can chew. If your child tends to seek oral input by chewing on their shirts, um, that maybe the sleeves or the neck of their shirts, then they might benefit for something um, like a chewy type necklace. And then a tent, like I said earlier, reset space um, is so important for a lot of our children. And even if your child is not sensitive to input, even if they are a seeker, they might also like a reset space, just a place that's their own, that has their sensory tools in it that they can access whenever they're dysregulated and they need that time to reset, okay? All right, so I'm also going to go over some books and resources that I think will really help you following this presentation to gain a lot more information because I could, this presentation could be, you know, a multiple day thing where I could give you lots and lots and lots of information and tools, but of course it's short. So I wanna make sure that you have resources that you can access that will give you um, more information on this topic. And then after, I go over those, we can get in some, into some of the questions. Okay, so um, behavior and uh, addressing behavior in a positive way. Um, these two books, Beyond Behaviors and Brain Body Parenting by Mona De La Hook. She's absolutely brilliant and approaches um, both 
you know, neurotypical behaviors and neurodivergent behaviors in a very positive way. Um, highly recommend both of those books. And there, there are some sensory books for you here as well, Sensational Kids um, by Lucy Jane Miller, Raising a Sensory Smart Child by Lindsay Beal, and The Out of Sync Child by Carol Kranowitz are all really good sensory books. Uh, the number one website that I recommend you visit is the sensoryhealth.org. This is the SPD Star Institute's website. It is chock full of information about sensory processing, all kinds of terminology, discussing sensory processing disorder um, more in depth. That will give you lots of information. The Therapist Neurodiversity Collective website will help you understand how therapists who are approaching therapy from a neurodiversity affirming way are doing this. That gives you information there. Sensory Smarts is Lindsay Beal's website and kellymeller.com. She talks all about interoception, which as I said, is a more newly understood uh, sense. And so you can get a lot of information on interoception there. And then just a few product recommendations, the therapyshop.com uh, and Fun and Function both have a ton of sensory products for you to purchase. And also you can find a lot of things uh, on places like Amazon and Target and things like that. But these are of course dedicated um, sensory tool websites for you to purchase things from. And then of course my Instagram page um, is at nurture underscore OT and I post a lot of sensory information on there. I have a lot of um, graphics that will help you better understand sensory processing disorder and all of those types of things. So if you want to join me there, um, I talk a lot about sensory processing in that space. And then last, I just want to um, show you my references um, where I received all of the information for today's presentation. So I think now um, we can take some of your questions. Wonderful. That um, was in incredibly useful and helpful information. And we have a fair number of questions before I right. launch in. I want to briefly thank Brain Balance again for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, the first uh, question I'd like to get to is next steps. A lot of listeners out there are mm -hmm. um, do not have a diagnosis for their child or perhaps for themselves. And they're wondering, um, is there a standard assessment for sensory processing disorder? You said it's not in the DSM. What is the best, best first place to go? Yeah. So um, you want to go talk to your doctor first. Um, you, especially if you are receiving services with insurance coverage, you need a doctor's referral to receive occupational therapy services or any other services that you might be seeking. Some people get physical therapy or speech services as well. Um, so you want to talk to your doctor. And what I really recommend is that you go to your doctor with very specific information. Um, this is what I'm seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. These are the sensory needs my child has. Um, here's how we're helping helping them currently. And here's why we're really struggling, why we're feeling like we need more support. Be very specific in the information that you're bringing to your doctor. Um, and you want to start looking um, in your area if you're hoping to receive occupational therapy services uh, for a therapist that understands sensory processing and specializes in that area. Um, so that they can address your child's needs specifically. Um, and if even though sensory processing disorder is not in the DSM, you can receive occupational therapy services under different diagnoses, whether it's a motor and coordination diagnosis or a nervous, a different, we use um, unspecified disorder of the central nervous system. There are other diagnoses that you can receive occupational therapy services under. And also if you are in the financial um, if you do have the financial capability, um, private pay occupational therapy services do not require a doctor referral um, or a diagnosis. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, very, very helpful. We uh, Just a quick follow-up question. Someone here asked, uh, you may have just answered it, but she said, if my son is diagnosed with ADHD, anxiety, and oppositional defiant disorder, will the school provide OT or even an evaluation to see if he needs sensory processing services. Um, if he hasn't been diagnosed with SPD, does he need a diagnosis in order to get these occupational therapy services? 
No, not necessarily. So what we have to remember, remember about the schools is that their needs have to be impacting their academics. They have to be impacting their academic function, usually to get services. And um, what you can do is talk to the school about receiving evaluation. Um, they definitely do not need a clinical diagnosis of SPD uh, to receive sensory supports. And there are a couple different ways to get sensory supports through the school. That can be either through a 504 or through an IEP if the child does have academic um, needs that accompany their sensory needs or diagnoses. Okay. Um, and here is a question um, that I quite liked. It said, greetings from a family that regularly falls down the stairs. Um, <laughs> when a therapist first suggested that my daughter might have SPD and I looked at the symptoms, it was like looking in a mirror. Since then, other articles I've read would suggest I'm just a highly sensitive person. Mm -hmm. How do you tell the difference and does it really matter? Usually we see some, again, some co-occurring between someone who's a highly sensitive person um, emotionally and sensory needs. So there's usually some sensitivity to sensory input when you're a highly sensitive person. Not always, but it's very common. Um, so if you notice that you have, you know, you have those sensory-based motor difficulties falling down the stairs, or you're very sensitive to sensory input and you need breaks from sensory input, you get touched out, you feel overwhelmed, then you probably do have some for, form of either sensory processing disorder or some pretty significant sensory needs. Um, so I think you can be pretty confident there's a sensory component there and that you need to honor and support your own sensory needs as well. Okay. Um, and you mentioned that um, sensory processing perhaps runs in your family. A number of people are wondering if there are studies suggesting that it is genetic. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's something that I feel like is still very new in the research, but we are finding that with any sort of neurodivergence, um, many sorts of neurodivergence, I don't want to say anything incorrect, there are genetic components. So um, we are finding that with autism and ADHD and sensory needs. And so, yes, I feel that we are proof of that as a family, but I think that, that that's where the research might be headed. But I would love to see, um, just a little soapbox here, that the research is headed more towards supports and how we can support uh, neurodivergent individuals versus just trying to find out um, why it happens. Um, we kind of know it happens, and I'm sure there will be research into the genetics, but we also want to devote our research to how we can support neurodivergent individuals. Right. A, a number of people also very interested in learning um, if there is any existing research on um, the prevalence of continued symptoms or, or manifestations in, in adulthood um, and uh, whether experiences in childhood tend to endure and change. So your, can yes. your sensory needs change yes. with age? Absolutely. Um, as we mature and as our brain matures, we know kind of that prefrontal cortex develops um, into our 20s. And so as your brain changes, your sensory needs and your ability to self-regulate will change. And so in turn, yes, your sensory how your sensory needs are presenting will change. However, they will likely continue. Um, so I feel that I have become more coordinated, not maybe more coordinated, but more aware of my environment because I can control things a little bit more as an adult, but I continue to have decreased proprioceptive awareness, vestibular awareness. I continue to trip and fall, um, but I'm able to handle it better and I'm able to accommodate myself better as an adult. I didn't know what to do when I was a child. However, for more information on this, again, I highly recommend you check out the um, sensory health org website, the Star Institute, they have resources for both children and adults. So if you as an adult are looking for more information on your sensory needs, I highly recommend you check them out. Excellent. Um, on a related, a number of caregivers here um, worried, understandably, that um, helping their child, you know, um, to, to change their environment, to 
really meet their sensory needs may be doing long-term harm by basically n- not allowing them to become desensitized, if you will, like mm-hmm. a- exposure therapy. Um, <sighs> I guess just the, the question being, you know, is it, are they doing a disservice by helping their child to avoid the senses that are causing them um, dysregulation? No, I, the, what I really like now as um, neurodiversity affirming practitioners is that the world for children with sensory needs is already very uncomfortable, okay? We don't need to make it more uncomfortable on purpose. We don't need to expose them to things that are uncomfortable on purpose. We can accommodate them as much as is needed in order to help them. They will still continue to experience things that are uncomfortable. They will, they will still continue to be exposed to things that are uncomfortable. So by accommodating them, Um, By helping them work through those things, we are helping them feel safe. And that safety, that feeling of safety is what is going to allow them to explore their world more. So instead of letting them be uncomfortable, making them uncomfortable, purposely pushing them into things that make them uncomfortable, we're saying, I'm going to help you feel safe. And that feeling of safety will naturally help them explore the environment's when they're comfortable. Um, So I would discourage any form of purposely exposing them to things that are uncomfortable. And this is part of the human rights movement of saying, we want other people to start to accept and acknowledge neurotype differences and that they need to access the world in the way that's safe and comfortable for them. Excellent. I think the the trickiest one, if I may, for, for caregivers out there is um, food sensitivities, because oh, yeah. there's the obvious worry that, I mean, malnourishment would be the most extreme, yeah. right? But that mm-hmm. by um, accommodating, they could be doing long-term damage. Are there special mm-hmm. considerations and or um, therapies that you would suggest specifically for those children who are, who are dealing with um, taste, smell, and sort of eating sensitivities that may impact their nutrition? Yes. So if you have a child who is a selective eater, who is very sensitive to different types of tastes, textures, et cetera, um, you probably already know you cannot force them to eat anything, nor um, is that ever recommended because that's a very unsafe place to be if someone is trying to force you to eat anything. Um, So safety around food is so incredibly important. And it's the same sort of concept. Safety feeling safe and respected in your choices will allow you to explore things more easily. Um, An OT or a speech therapist who is educated in feeding therapy um, from a sensory perspective um, and also has oral motor training is somebody who can help support your child through that. So I would strongly recommend outpatient um, OT or speech therapy if your child has feeding uh, sensitivities that are impacting their nutrition. That's what um, the big uh, piece is there. If their nutrition is impacted, that's when you would want to seek services. Okay, excellent. Um, We had a couple of questions regarding the signs, the auditory signs of sensory discrimination disorder. Um, Mm -hmm. And one in particular regarding a child um, with suspected sensory issues is talking very loudly and having a difficult time distinguishing how their voice um, relates to, is that uh, how loud their voice is, excuse me, does that relate to sensory processing disorder? It could, absolutely. Um, It could be, this is why it's important to work with a professional who's trained in sensory processing or sensory integration, because it could be discrimination. It also, also could be Um, sensory modulation. Sometimes I will have clients who talk loudly in order to block out other sensory input, other auditory input that's bothering them. So them making noise um, gives feedback to their body through bone conduction, and it also blocks out sensory input that they don't enjoy hearing. So it could be discrimination. It could be modulation. Um, It's hard to say, but there definitely is, could be a sensory component there. That's very interesting because we had some other questions regarding kids who are sort of always need to be singing, making noises, speaking. Um, Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that may be similarly related. Yes, exactly. Very interesting. I had not heard that before. Um, 
So, and another question regarding um, a parent of a younger child, wondering if sensory processing could be linked to challenges with toileting. So specifically like withholding their bathroom use um, yeah. due to, to sensory um, discomfort. Absolutely. So it can be um, a sensitivity to the um, the actual going, or it can be an under lack of awareness of when it's coming. Um, so we talked a lot about that interoception, um, the sensory processing, it extends into interoception and the feeling of having to go. And then also the sensitivity sometimes um, pooping and the splash of the water and things like that can be very overwhelming to a child who's sensitive. So um, there are different reasons for why a child might be withholding, um, and it definitely can be a sensory interoceptive component. Sorry, my apologies. Um, and could you give a brief overview of um, having a number of questions regarding um, auditory processing disorder and just how that could be related here to sensory processing, kind of trying to differentiate um, the two. Yeah. So there's always um, likely some form of sensory component there and sensory therapy helps children who have auditory processing issues. And then there's also us usually a component that would be addressed by a speech therapist and has to do with language processing and things like that. So um, if your child has that and they're not already seeing a speech therapist, that would be something you could pursue, but you also definitely could pursue occupational therapy. And there are um, interventions that help with auditory processing from a sensory perspective as well. Excellent. Okay. Um, and let's see. Um, I wanted to, we have so many great questions here. I would love <laughs> to thank, thank our listeners for, um, for submitting so many of them. It's really, um, there are so many good ones here. Someone says that um, they wrote in to say that, that they're listening in tears because they're finally oh, well. understanding that um, being told you're difficult or weird or annoying and having these issues was not my fault. It's just my brain. So, um, you know, there's a lot of um, light bulbs going off and, and help being shared here today. It's very heartwarming. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm trying to get as, to as many questions as possible. Um, yeah. And one that has come up quite a, quite a lot, again, with caregivers is um, the challenges of having um, children with very different sensory needs, some yeah. who are sensory seeking and other ones who are quite the opposite. Um, yeah. I wonder if you can offer any general advice for those parents who are balancing some very conflicting needs. Oh, that is so difficult. And that's where I think if you can find a provider who works with your family as a unit, instead of just working with an individual child, let's say. So that's something that I try to do with my families is that um, your whole family has to be feel supported. Of course, my client is the child, but how can you balance that? How can you set up your home so that there are spaces to access for your child that has one set of sensory needs and a different space to access maybe for another child that has sensory needs? And how much can we expect each child um, to respect the other one's sensory needs? Um, and I think what we can find interesting is sometimes there are there is some crossover. Um, a child who's sensory sensitive may also benefit from some sensory input from a swing or from some proprioceptive input, whereas a sensory seeker also is seeking that. Um, and so sometimes those regulatory tools can be used for both children, and then will help them um, be regulated in order to tolerate the other's sensory needs. So we have to think about that um, and maybe finding a provider who can work with your family as a unit. Um, maybe they can treat both um, children and understand your family um, and set up your environment at home in a way that supports you um, and maybe some strategies that naturally support both children. Excellent. Um, and we do have a number of adults listening today who are sort of seeing for the first time that perhaps they are um, showing signs of sensory processing disorder. You had so many wonderful suggestions of products um, that were more geared toward children. Are there any in particular that you have found helpful for adults who are looking um, 
yeah, looking for some solutions. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of adults like weighted blankets. Um, some of those things, they seem like they're for kids, but you can use them as adults. You can use fidgets. You can use a swing. You can use a sensory pod. You can use a body sack. And there are some designed larger. I mean, because we're using them with children who are up to 18 years old, let's say. So they're adult size. Um, you can use all of those products. Um, one other company that um, is newer is called the Sensory Sweater. Um, and it's actually a big, stretchy sweatshirt that um, you pull over your entire body and you get inside, you curl your legs up and it gives you deep pressure. Um, I believe that the creator of the company is neurodivergent and it's amazing. And I said, wow, you can be anywhere and curl your body up to that sweater and get uh, sensory input. Sounds really good to me as someone who likes um, that sort of input. So any of those tools, they're not just for kids. They can be for adults as well. Um, and, you know, you don't have to feel ashamed if it's something that accommodates you and allows you to function throughout your daily life, you should try it 100%. And those are wonderful words to end today's discussion on. Um, I, we are unfortunately out of time, but this has just been such a useful, helpful, and enlightening conversation. Candace, thank you so much for joining Attitude for this webinar today. Um, leading this discussion and answering the questions from our audience. Um, everyone who's out there listening, thank you for your contributions and for joining us today. Um, we really hope that you will come again for another Attitude webinar. We have them weekly. And our next one is on reducing social anxiety in adults with ADHD with Dr. Sharon Celine. And that is next week. So um, we hope you will join us then. In the meantime, visit attitudemag.com for a lot more resources. And we will provide all of the recommendations um, shared today by Candace in the slides and also in the follow-up. Uh, email that you receive. So thanks again for joining us, Candace, mm -hmm. and for everyone out there. Have a wonderful day.